The Cure with Amy Cabo. Life can bring many difficult situations, domestic violence, addictions, poverty, and even sexual abuse by your loved ones. Welcome, Amy Cabo and The Cure. I'm Amy Cabo, and this is The Cure. We're live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can listen to us live on GodIsTheCure.com or later listen to the recorded shows via podcast. I'm also joined by Dr. Boris Nikolov, who is my partner at work and in life. Hello. This show deals with any kind of suffering and the tenacity of the human spirit, the will to survive, and the courage to keep moving forward, despite any obstacle, with the help of God and each other. We do provide testimonials to let people know that they're not alone, and in this show, the testimony started with me having been a survivor from childhood trauma and well into my young adulthood. We also have professionals in the medical field and inspirational speakers that are willing to help and give valuable information because education is key and transparency is needed at least to break the cycle. For me, my healing came from God, but other forms of healing are presented as well to service everyone. In today's show, we will talk about the difficulty of parenthood, especially for mothers. Our moms having more stress and anxiety than ever before. And today, our special guest will help us with those questions, Fran Petra. She says there are a number of things mothers can do to keep their sanity, including making sure everyone in the household pitches and chores, and as soon as they're old enough. Petra says, keep children on a calendar. Everyone's plan for the week. Enforce a curfew and make sure you take care of your own needs as well, keeping the parenting stress level low. Fan Petra is an author of the book Twins Times Three, which means she had three sets of twins. (laughs) And an inspiring musician, by the way. She's a proud mother, but she refuses to let any role define her for the rest of her life. Her three sets of twins include twin boys, twin girls, and one twin set that includes a boy and a girl. As the kids were growing up, Petra did freelance work as a graphic designer, wrote and published a book, and returned to school to become a licensed medical massage therapist. Today, she works part as a physical therapy team. Her first album, entitled You Always Were, consists of a full seven-length original songs and was released in November 2018. Fran, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Amy. How are you? Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you, Fran. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's an absolute honor. It's really interesting. I was reading about you, and I know that there's things in the world that can harm us, and motherhood, and it could be a stressful situation. But um, please tell us that what are some of the challenging just that you have encountered having three sets of twins or even multiple children, children, what are the challenges that you can run into? Absolutely, well, I can only really speak from my own personal experiences of only having children in sets of two each time and then times three. Um, the challenges started immediately when I was um, you know, told that I had a high risk, high risk pregnancy right away. And, you know, I had a lot of struggles with each pregnancy. Um, Everyone ended up um, just fine uh, and not born too early, but there is a significant challenges that happen when you are pregnant with more than one baby. And then as we um, had our children come along, um, you know, you don't know it until you become a parent, just how 110% of your entire being becomes being a parent and so you have to sort of get into a whole new mindset your world of being you as the center is completely over (laughs) however you know there's so many blessings in it but you do it is a matter of survival i i believe that each time the new babies came home all i could think about was sleep (laughs) needing (laughs) to sleep that basic need that we all have that we take for granted was something that I did not have the luxury of having for months and months. And so my way to answer your question in terms of how to 
deal with the stress that comes along with having one, two, six children is that you do have to take care of yourself and you do have to focus on your needs because if you don't, who is going to take care of the children? So uh, sleep is number one. Number two, feed yourself well. Don't try to comfort and convenience eat, but feed your body with good, healthy nutrition. And at the same, and then on the third note that I say, always try to get some exercise. Try to stretch first thing in the morning. This is what I do. Stretch in the evening to release that tension and stress. All of those things combined with holding a strong faith center with my husband and I, we have gone through six children and we have come through much stronger on the other side of it all. Not only do we survive, but we all have thrived and it's been, you know, the good and the bad, but it's all been just an amazing experience. Well, you're very inspirational because I have to tell you, we have two children and we've, I mean, we have three, but one's already an adult, but the the other two is is a teenager and an 11 year old 14 and 11 mm-hmm. and we feel like our plate is full I, I don't know how you do it <laughs> I guess you have better parenting skills uh, I don't no, know No, I think it just comes with it it comes with the need you know necessity is the mother <laughs> that, of invention. yes <laughs> very true very true for those tuning in uh, I'm Amy Cabo and this is the cure you can listen to us live on GodIsTheCure.com or later in a podcast. Today, we're with Fran Petrie talking about the challenges of motherhood. Fran, your husband sometimes was away on business trips. How did you handle being the only parent with so many children during those times? Yeah. What did you do? Very keep, good question. Very good question. Because it was, <laughs> exactly. It was very challenging in the very beginning. And, you know, so many of us start out with the just the image of being that perfect parent, having all those pots on the stove, they're simming perfect, and everything is just going so smoothly. Well, in the very beginning, when I had just the two baby girls to begin with, and my husband is an architect, and he would often travel to go to different job sites around the state and outside the state, and um, and when that would happen, I just made sure I had everything just as you know regimented as possible so I could keep my sanity. However, and that was actually pretty doable in the beginning. However add a couple of more children and then maybe a couple more children into that mix and he was continuing to travel over the years and I found that with all the moving parts of now having school aged children and children going off to extracurricular activities afterward plus more infants and double strollers etc I found that following the least you know the, the path of least resistance was the way to go trying to be perfect and trying to put that type of pressure on myself of, of covering everything possible sometimes was just too much to sustain. And Basically I found that giving yourself a break. You, you got to give yourself absolutely. a break. Absolutely. Definitely. And I also find that when, when you are stressed out, your children pick up on that, and their behavior could be one of two things. You could either, either have a child that is wanting to step up and help you, or, in my case, <laughs> I have children taking advantage of the, case, the fact that mom doesn't have her act together today for whatever oh, reason. Oh, that's fun. Um, and, and I'm looking so, yeah, at your website. So, I see that you have four teenagers at the same time. I don't know how updated did, your picture yeah. is. How did you do that? <laughs> it is One recent. teenager? Oh, my goodness. You don't <laughs> even want to hear the story. How did you do four teenagers? I, I live it. Well, I mean, um, oh, what did you... In- <laughs> A military style, spirituality, what was it? Uh, we're dying to know. <laughs> well, you know, in the very beginning, every child of ours, all raised under the same uh, guidelines of, they understood that they were expected to, to do uh, certain things for our home. We, you know, you're part of this, you're part of the mess makers, then you're going to be part of the cleanup. <laughs> and if this didn't happen, there were some serious repercussions. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, you have to do what you need to do to, to, to keep your sanity and to keep your home moving in a, in a well-oiled machine fashion if possible. And so um, every one of these six, six children are completely different. They have completely different thought processes and mindsets and goals. However, um, we try to keep them in line as much as possible. As much as I possible. Guess, I guess. I guess the main go. thing. I guess the main thing is to <laughs> make sure there's a consequence and be persistent and follow through. And you are, and you are yes. persistent, and you do follow through absolutely, well, and that's what we would do. I, and I guess you did that very well. 
said. Well, I mean, about, you know, as much as we could. And was it always perfect? Absolutely not. Um, now, the older girls now are 24. The second set of twins, the boy and girl set, are now 19 and just finished their first year in college. And we also have 11-year-old boys. So I still have, I still have the elementary school ages, and now I've got the college. We had four graduations last year, two college graduations and two high school graduations, all within three months. And that nice. was an amazing year. <laughs> nice. That is incredible. Yes. That's, yes. It's all been a blessing. Thank God. Be right back with Amy Cabell and The Cure. And now we will continue with Amy Cabell and The Cure. Welcome back to the show. For those that are just tuning in, I'm Amy Cabo, and you're listening to The Cure. We're talking about the challenges of motherhood, and we're joined by our special guest, Fran, Fran Petrie. Fran, I have to tell you, I see that you're a musician, and I think that's wonderful, because I did not have it so smoothly, even though I had less children than you. I, my first child, when she was a teenager, she rebelled, and uh, I don't know if it was because we weren't strict enough, but our situation was a little bit different. My daughter had gone through 14 years of custody battles, and I think that can really uh, play uh, a role in how the kid feels growing up, especially oh, sure. when both parents are you know, maybe being too lenient, trying to please the kid all the time so that the kid still loves them, so that the kid will still want to live with them, or maybe the opposite, they, they poison the kid against the other parent, and that causes added stresses. So I'm still trying to figure out mm -hmm. if it's something that I went wrong, or if it's just that's how life goes sometimes when you go through challenges. But I'm trying a little better with my two younger children by putting them in a Christian school, I like to be spiritual, and I feel, well, wherever I fall short, God can pick up. That's but a wonderful attitude to have. The way that I was able to feel better, because it is sad, nowadays my daughter does not speak to me. She's 26, and I think about it, and it saddens me, and one day I had a very difficult, difficult uh, night, I, I kept waking up and I felt super sick and I was thinking to myself, how is this possible? How, how am I going through this? And then that's the first time I heard, if you cross her, then you cross me. And that was super therapeutic for me. And that song helped me get through it. I, the rest of the nights were good. I was happy. But the point that I'm trying to say is music was a therapeutic tool for me and from what I've been through in life I've always used music and I wonder if that's something that you also found useful in your raising of so many twins <laughs> I'm so glad that you shared that with me and um, wow I, you know I and I can completely relate to you when it comes to that and I have my firstborn as my the first set of my first set of twins she and I from the time she was 11 we had such a battle of wills. And it doesn't matter how many children you have, it doesn't matter if they're all raised in the same home with the same you know, guidelines and rules, etc. Every child is going to be different. Everyone's going to re uh, uh, respond different to situations and challenges. Honestly, with my four older children, when I had our last set of twins, that really put a lot of pressure on our family. It, was, it, was, it took mom away from them for at, at times when the girls were 13 uh, and the how, second set were about How eight, did it put pressure on you? I mean, how was it? How could it, could you explain a little bit about that? Well, I mean, just exactly. for other people well, that have twins. Certainly, yes. Well, because when you know, I went on bed rest with my pregnancy halfway through, that took me away from being what I needed to be for my children. Okay. I couldn't drive them to places. I couldn't take care of them. I couldn't do, couldn't be the 100% mom that I could be. Then when the babies arrived, my 110% of myself went to the care around the clock of these two tiny boys. And so I tried to divide myself up and be everything that I could be to four other children, plus these two, plus my husband, plus myself. 
Did you have any help at all? Did you have a sister? Uh, my mother. An aunt, well, grandma? Yes, my mother and... Exactly. My mother and my mother-in-law each took turns, oh, mostly when God. I was on bed rest. But, but after the babies came, my mother-in-law for a while. But to answer your question about music, music has been part of who I am since the, before I was born, I, I think. I think I was singing in the crib always, so we'll say that, you know, that I sang before I spoke, too. Um, when, during the times that I found most stressful, even before I had children, um, I was in a band uh, in the D.C. area. That was my therapy, just to get away to, 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 to band rehearsal and to be able to just sing, just to be able to be around the music. When I had my children, I started to freelance as a designer from my home to bring in the supplemental income that we needed. I would wow. go into my office while they were napping or, or while they were at school, that type of thing, and up went the music. Everyone knew where to find mom because they could hear me before they looked for me. Nice. So they could hear me singing while I was working. That was it was it's a way to to calm the soul and to and to lift the spirit. And so the younger boys were turning ten uh, a couple of years ago when I rounded that bend and realized there was no other young children and it came back into my life and I took it back into me again and started to live the full myself again by by being able to perform you know, and do it on a professional level again, which has been such a blessing. Nice. I mean, that that's incredible. Because music has been a big part of, of my life, too. And believe it or not, I believe that there's messages that God does help us in different ways, whether it be our husband, our pets, our children, a post that we read, a song that we hear. I swear, if there's beautiful songs that people can write to dedicate to someone they love, imagine if God is dedicating that to us. I like to imagine that. It's nice. Yes, I absolutely agree. And uh, I believe that this is the time in my life when I was supposed to write particular music based on the experiences, the hardships, the struggles that we all go through. I think that, yes, younger artists that are singer-songwriters probably you know come up with a wonderful life experience to base it on however when you get to a certain point in your life with a lot under your belt i think that you have just a, a array of experiences to draw from when it comes to being able to write music that can relate to people and that people can say oh my gosh she's singing directly to me she knows exactly what i'm going through and how about and, when uh, you hear that song that has exactly to do with what you're thinking and what are the chances of you hearing it at that moment during that short drive that it happens to play just for you and, too much of a and coincidence that is the right that's the miracle that all we have to do is look for those miracles every single day every well, minute of the day keep your They're eyes there open. for us god blesses us we every just day. have to see them we just have to recognize them I mean, the children are a blessing, I have to tell you, because I had nine pregnancies, and I have only three children. So the fact that, you know, the pregnancy, people don't realize it is a huge blessing in itself. But kids don't come with an instruction booklet. <laughs> they don't come no, with don't. the how-to. It's like, here you oh, are, right. and figure it out. And that's what I had at 18. Here you are and figure it out. By the way, you're alone in the world. Wow. So, yeah, I kind of grew up with exactly. my daughter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wonderful. Well, my, my mother said that. I remember she said they, they put that beautiful little baby boy in her arms and she said, honey, I love you. I have no idea what to do with you. <laughs> That's so funny. And that was my mom. So. <laughs> but, I just, you know, we all somehow, we just have to make our way somehow because we all grow with our children. We are doing this journey together. Um, we're not perfect, and we're never going to be perfect. However, like you said, when we when we put our trust and we say that whatever I can't do, God will take over. I yes. absolutely believe in that. And you know, with with Him as the center of our marriage and the center of our lives, we have been able to uh, instill that in our children as well. And it and it makes me so proud to see the ones that even when they're struggling, and they do, they all do, they all have their ways to make. And nice. we can't do it for We're them. We're coming on to we break, can't Fran. Do it for, them. for those that are, we have been right. talking with Fran Peter, author and musician. Thank you for being on the show. Can you find Thank more you. information on the website, franpetre.com, or on God is the Cure under guests? It was great having you, Fran. Thank you so much. 
Amy, what a pleasure. What an honor. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day. We will be right back with Amy Cabell and The Cure. And now we will continue with Amy Cabell and The Cure. We're back. I'm Amy Cabell. You can listen to us every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern on your radio or goddessthecure.com. And talking about medicine, <laughs> we are going to talk about teeth and how to clean them through a holistic approach. While many people desire whiter teeth, a brighter smile, and fresher breath, dental professionals warn that some toothpastes on the grocery store shelves contain potential harmful ingredients. And today, we have a special guest who will help us with these questions, Nami Patel. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Nami Patel. She operates a practice called Green Dentistry in San Francisco and is an author of Age with Style, Your Guide to a Youthful Smile and Healthy Living. A graduate of the University of California School of Dentistry, she is a leader in the movement to bring environmental sanity and well-being into the dental world. Dr. Patel focuses on helping patients recognize the vital connection between dental health and whole body health. And her website is www.sfgreendentist.com. Hi, Dr. Patel. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Amy. Thanks for having me on the show. Dr. Patel, uh, you know, it's very interesting that you have a holistic approach, and I, I've never heard of this. So please, please enlighten us. What are some of the ingredients that are considered harmful, most harmful anyway, in conventional toothpaste brands, and how can they affect our, our health or overall health? Yeah, so uh, you know what's interesting is that um, a lot of the ingredients that we have in our foods and toothpaste, um, the government or the FDA just really doesn't have a lot of information about. And we've used these ingredients for a long time. Um, there are things like sodium lauryl sulfate, uh, which it gives like the soap, the foamy texture. What okay. it actually does is stops off gum tissue and disrupts cellular activity. So it actually stops your, you know, cells from dividing, which is a huge concern, especially with the concerns we have with cancer and, um, you know, just a lot of the toxicity we have in our environment. Yeah, and I heard bad teeth can affect the heart as well. Absolutely. So the bacteria in your gums are linked to heart disease, Alzheimer's, decreased immunity, um, and it actually just causes a myriad of problems, mainly because your mouth is the beginning of your gut. Uh, and for a long time, I feel like people thought that, you know, dentistry is a luxury item. We don't necessarily need to make it part of our health, but it is the number one important thing for longevity. It, uh, keeping your natural teeth actually adds extra 10 years to your life. Wow. It's a necessity. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This, I mean, yeah, I mean, and so tell us if the regular toothpaste, the conventional toothpaste, the brands, I don't know, I guess Colgate or whatever is out there, and you say that they can be harmful, what are some alternative ingredients that we can use for to make a homemade toothpaste, for example, that would be safer than the on-shelf brands? Absolutely. So the on-shelf brands tend to create, basically it has over 20 to 30 ingredients, um, which include like FD&C blue dye, they're derived from coal tar, and they can cause ADHD. Um, we are, there's wow. also triclosan, which is a pesticide, believe it or not, and it's cancer-causing. Wow. Um, also, yeah, also tetrasodium phosphate, which binds to the ions, and it makes you actually get cavities. Um, which is actually in direct conflict with what you're doing with toothpaste. You're wanting toothpaste to be natural. You want it to remove the bacteria. You want to feel good, like you said, fresh breath. Um, so what I used to I didn't know you can make homemade toothpaste. Most people don't. Yes, yes. So make your toothpaste, and it takes literally about five to ten minutes. You can order nice. things off of Amazon or your local, you know, grocery store. Uh, so the ingredients that I like are coconut oil, and okay. uh, that's really. Get great because coconut oil is actually it naturally fights off bacteria. Also, for uh, ger you know the geriatric population, it actually hydrates the gum tissues because dry mouth can be an issue. I uh, thought that was only for hair. Okay, teeth. And it works no, for that too. Oil. Okay. Yep. 
And then um, pumice is really great because it will find pumice. It will remove all the stains and, like, naturally whiten your teeth. Now, these are ingredients that you combine? Are these ingredients Mm -hmm. you combine or by themselves? Yep. You combine them? you can combine them. Yep, and absolutely. what what um, percentage, what percentage, half and half, or, I mean. So what I use is four ounces of coconut oil, and then I use uh, about a teaspoon of hummus. Um, okay. And then I add a couple of oils for taste. Like you said, you want to have the fresh breath. So my favorites are the On Guard oil, which has cinnamon and cardamom, so it gives you that freshness, and also peppermint oil. So about 20 drops of peppermint oil and the On Guard oil, or you could do it separately, coconut, um, cardamom and cinnamon, and it actually adds that fresh breath that you're really looking for. Um, oh, let's say people breath. don't have per- peppermint oil. Where do you get this, the pe- peppermint oil or On Guard oil? This is also new to me. Yeah, so you can get um, peppermint oil at your local uh, food store. A Whole Foods is going to have it, or you can go okay. on to uh, Amazon, and you can get it on Amazon. Okay, great. It literally is just mix. It's like baking in the kitchen, uh, just putting a couple ingredients together, mixing it up, and it's ready for use. It's probably going to take you about three minutes to make your toothpaste, which is going to last you about three to six months. Nice, and it will have the consistency of, consistency of toothpaste. Obviously, it'll be a lot healthier for you. Yes, the natural, healthier, you'll feel better, and your teeth look naturally white. So there's no need for any additional whitening product, um, and so it works really, really well, well. So I usually recommend just make your own. It takes a couple minutes. It's super easy, cost-effective, and you know exactly what's going in there, because who thought pesticides were in your toothpaste? Uh, Dr. Patel, you mentioned that the FDA doesn't regulate... Uh the toothpaste so i mean really these are like super harmful substances that you say so there is nothing that we can do actually the fda does regulate it it's just that they don't have enough information about the product uh so when they're looking at uh like the fd and c blue dye they're just looking at that surface ingredient they're not really looking at where it's actually derived from um and that's just uh, we need to take an extra Step and go deeper and figure out how are these products being made and what are the long-term effects because they don't have the long-term studies that actually show that this is a safe product for us. Oh, interesting. And I was wondering, now that we have a dentist on the line, <laughs> tell us how are we not going to be scared of you? Like, for example, me. I know I need to go to a dentist. I He's am super scared. <laughs> Super I'm, scared. I'm <laughs> but, you know, tell me what, do, I mean, I know it's very important for me. I know Doctors it's very are the worst patients. <laughs> I know it's very important for me for my health. But then, I mean, tell me something or tell our audience something to motivate. Like, how can you get away with not going to the dentist? <laughs> 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 yes, you can. That's what you do. Um, so if you want my honest answer, what I'm going to tell you is it's okay to be scared. And it's actually yeah. normal to be scared. And instead of fighting the fear, embrace it. Because embrace fear it. is actually a really amazing <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> yes. Um, and you know what? Fear tells us to keep, it's telling us be aware, right? It keeps you so, on your feet. And, yeah. Exactly. So be aware. Yes. So fear is actually a good thing. And use it to, you know, for your advantage versus deterring it. So if you're scared about something, the biggest thing that needs to happen is you need more education about what is actually the problem, how do you fix it, and how can you be comfortable? Because that's what your body is wanting to know. It's scared of needles drilled in a big bill, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that, so, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't, feel, so I don't get it. I don't feel the needle. It's not painful for me. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. It, it, everyone's really different. So but, the best thing to do is figure out how to cope with it. So if you are scared of a needle, it's probably okay. But the, the reality of it is after you get numb, you actually survive. And it's important for your body to notice yeah. that, hey, I survived. <laughs> um, and the analogy I would like to use is, you know, I have the strongest men or the strongest women who have natural childbirth, but when it comes to a needle, they're very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it, it's okay. It's uh, important to embrace that because your body is just, you know, scared about something that may go wrong. But once we put it into perspective and, you know, the chances of things going wrong with, 
you know, childbirth uh, is a lot higher than something when we anesthetize somebody locally um, yeah. into one tooth or, or an area. I hear you. That's definitely true. <laughs> you know, fear causes more pain. I yeah, think and then because the tension. You, you anticipate the pain and maybe sometimes you create it. But yes. what, what techniques do you use with your with your with your Patience? patients? Yes, I mean, so how do you call them? I, because this one's a tough one. Let's <laughs> see how you. What are your secrets? <laughs> so the number one thing that I recommend, Amy, is to make sure you're building a trust. So before you even go in to get any sort of work done, go and meet your dentist. Okay. Um, interview them. Um, Share with them your concerns. Say, hey, I've had a bad experience. This is how old I was. This is what occurred. Um, I'm really concerned about A, B, and C. And it may be the noise, or it may be the needle, or it may just be, you know, just wanting to come in. Um, And there's options. So, like, for somebody who can't even step into the dental practice, you know, there's sedation, so you can be put to sleep to do the dental work. And it's, uh, like, taking a value. We're coming up on break. When we are back, we will continue talking with Dr. Patel about how to take care of our teeth. We would love to hear from you. We will be right back with Amy Cabell and The Cure. And now we will continue with Amy Cabell and The Cure. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Amy Cabo, and this is The Cure. You can listen to us every Saturday at 1 p.m. We're live. GodIsTheCure.com. And we're here joined by Dr. Nami Patel. Hi, Dr. Nami Patel. Nami, I, I wanted to ask you, education is key because a lot of the reasons people have bad teeth and they let it go for a while, they don't realize that it can lead to other, other that it can lead to other ailments and other conditions and it can make you sick and it can, it can affect your heart and other systems of your body. In fact, I learned about this when I found out that I had to clean my dog's teeth very often because the same thing happens with them. Teeth are the same everywhere you go. So I think part of the problem is that people don't realize this and education is very important. I know that you've written a book, Age with Style, Your Guide to Youthful Smile and Healthy Living. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is that a good guide for someone to really get educated about what really are the dangers of not taking care of your teeth? Absolutely. So the book actually goes through the logistics of um, what actually happens when you don't go to the dentist, and go. then also ways to be I'm able to calm your fears, yeah. <laughs> and then also just go over any you know concerns you have. Also, it may be about whether it's about sort of treatment, because sometimes we kind of know what we need if it's been a long time. You know, you need like a deep cleaning. What does that mean? Am I going to need needles and drills? And uh, how is it, uh, does it affect the rest of my body? You know, the bacteria in the gums are linked to Alzheimer's. Um, and so if you don't go to the dentist regularly, these bacteria overgrow and they cross the blood-brain barrier and actually are related to Alzheimer's. So that's amazing. Like that, that you uh, dentist, dentists don't tell you this. No. And it's not something that they, you know, on a regular basis that somebody's looking at either. And so it's really important to educate yourself on healthy living in general. So the book actually talks about each stage of your life. So in uh, every 10 years, like what should you be looking for from infancy or pregnancy even to infancy to toddlers and then going into, um, you know, teenagers, adult, young adults and then adults, 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s, because there are certain things that are happening with the body that are related to the teeth. And so that way you're able to have a better idea of how to take care of yourself and be proactive because it is so much easier to be proactive than reactive. Exactly. Okay, so how old do we need to take our kids to the dentist the first time? At six months is when I recommend to take the kids. Um, wow. Only because they're getting comfortable. Yeah, and you know we talked about dental fear earlier. Do they even have to eat at six months? <laughs> Some yes, of them might. Do. Oh, okay, <laughs> do. it's been a long they time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then how often so after I, that? You know, uh, I was going to say the first time at six months, mainly because um, they get to see the dentist and realize that things are not scary. Because a lot of the fear actually comes from TV or it comes from people talking about dental experiences. So when the kids are coming in at six months, because their brains are being, subconscious is being developed at that point in time. 
they get comfortable with the noises, the sounds, the tools, and then it helps them realize it's not really scary. And then they get really comfortable with it. So every six months after that. Nice. See, that's important to know because that's not how my parents did it. In fact, us nine children, we, my mother had a friend who was a dentist, so we never went to the dentist. He just said, open your mouth, everything looks good, that's good. And we didn't even know a dentist was necessary. Oh, so, big difference. And you imagine people have Alzheimer's and they have cancer and they think they have no idea that it's linked to poor dental hygiene. Well, maybe, maybe it's linked. Or, or, no, she just said it was linked. It, it definitely is, it definitely <laughs> is. <laughs> so, for, for example, root canals are linked to cancer, you know, amalgams are linked to Alzheimer's as well. So, the condition of your mouth is definitely linked to the rest of your body. Right. And so, the, about the amalgams, so there is a lot of, that was very used before, there is a lot of people that, that still have it. Is it safe to take it out? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you were my family member and you had amalgams in your mouth, I would definitely recommend removing them. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Because uh, <laughs> they are linked, uh, they bind, uh, they really just mess up our immune response. And it just causes a lot of my rate of problems. Um, and it's just, it, when we have better options, why put ourselves through that? You know, in the 80s, they didn't have any alternatives. Now we have those great materials that are biocompatible. So it's been true and tested. Um, and these materials actually don't leak and don't cause problems. So I would definitely recommend remove your amalgam for sure. Well, I wanted to ask you because there, there, there are groups of people that have maybe healthier teeth or better teeth. I remember when we found out that Boris needed to go to the dentist, somebody said, oh, because he's from Europe, the, the, the teeth are not as good. Is that true? Is there really a difference about, uh, I mean, is genetics involved in whether you have healthy teeth or not? Is it? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Genetics is really involved. Also, you know, during the pregnancy stage, was the mom getting enough nutrients because calcium is really important? Um, also, what's, uh, you know, in combination to genetics is also the diet. Um, there tend to be harder diets or occupations where people are, you know, of stress a lot. For example, lawyers, they tend to crack their teeth a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Grind. So, our yeah. environment plus our genetics may have a huge impact on, on our teeth for sure. And is it true if you have like bleeding gum? It's, That's not it's, good. It's, <laughs> it's related to, for example, you didn't go to, the, to clean it more often? Or? Like flossing? Yes. Fossing. So what um, bleeding is telling you is a sign of infection. It's saying that there's a lot of bacteria there uh, because oh. normally so go you, know, to the you shouldn't be bleeding. Yeah. yeah, so go to the dentist, you know, start flossing more, making sure you're getting all the bacteria out. So here's the thing, guys, with bacteria, it's like we want good bacteria to be present because in our body, there's always going to be good bacteria and bad bacteria. So we just have to make sure that the bad bacteria doesn't overgrow because when they overgrow is when you get the bleeding, then you get these diseases and also cavities and a lot of other problems because you have saliva. When you swallow, it goes right into your body and it has direct access to your bloodstream. So is it true that when you do deep cleaning more often, it makes you even go more often? I think that's a what, what I recommend with deep cleaning is it's kind of the analogy I like to use is um, it's, it's a swamp. And so we want to go from a swamp to a pond. And okay. so in order to do that, it's going to take time. So if you do it, if you go to the dentist one time, it's not going to do the job. you got to go right. consistently. So get the deep cleaning done. Go every three months for the first two years. Every and then that way months. you know that. Mm -hmm. And then probably after that, maybe every four months or every six months, depending on how you're doing. But it's a disease. You've got to cure it. And it takes time. A one-time one situation isn't going to do the trick. Unfortunately, um, it, it, some of us you know, go to the dentist when it, we're hurting, when it's too late, when the tooth needs to be removed. Right. Yes, and it sucks. So, <laughs> you know, it's the hardest thing to go through. Yeah, that's uh, a, that was the all-time yeah. dentistry. When you go to, when you are hurt, go to the dentist, take it out. Problem resolved. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, no. you know, our life 
our life expectancy back then was 45, 50, or 60 there you at go. most, you know? Yeah. <laughs> now we're going to 90, 100, 120. So, you know, there, there's a whole huge correlation with keeping your teeth that adds that uh, that adds the longevity for the teeth. And then also you're, you're able to enjoy life. You're able to chew and have and nuts food. and steak and whatever mm-hmm. you want. And I don't know anybody that feels good not feeling comfortable about not being able to smile. It, it's very important. And also, it's also important for nutrition. You don't want to be fed through the stomach. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. but let me ask you, how many times, this is a million dollar question, because I have to struggle with my children with this one. How many times a day should we brush our teeth? So an ideal number, Amy, is going to be every time you eat. But realistically, it's at minimum twice a day. So okay. first thing when you wake up in the morning and then at night before you go to sleep, the key is always to floss first, then brush your teeth. So can you tell me why it's important to brush it also at night so I can tell this to my kids? Mainly because when you're going to sleep, you have, you've you been eating all day. So all the bacteria has been on in your mouth. Um, basically, anytime you eat anything, it's like a big party for the bacteria. They divide and they grow, um, and they sit on your teeth. <laughs> so, you know, if you kicked in the kitchen, you'd want to sleep it, right? You wouldn't leave dirty dishes in the sink. You would want to clean them up, at least rinse them, and then, you know, put them to the side so that way the bugs don't get in there. Um, and so when you don't floss and brush your teeth at night, what happens is the bacteria sit there, and then at night, you don't have as much saliva. So that mouth is dry. So those bacteria really stick to your teeth. And then you get cavities from the mouth being dry, right? Yes. Aha. I knew it. Well, (laughs) (laughs) I think I have a good enough reason to tell them to brush their teeth twice a day now. Absolutely. And, you know, give them some gadgets. I'm a big fan of electric toothbrushes. I'm a big fan of the water pig, so it takes the water and squirts it between the teeth, so that way in lieu of flossing, so it's far more comfortable, it's quicker, easier, more effective. Um, so I really like that because, and, and we're in a generation with iPhones and you know cryptocurrency, we like technology. So let's use that technology to you know save us a lot of pain, right? Actually, they even have water flosses that you can connect to the shower, and you don't even make a water mess. Exactly. exactly. And do, I, do so, you recommend electronic toothbrushes uh, better than I, the ones that are yes, manual? Yes, I do. I absolutely recommend electric toothbrushes, um, mainly because it hits your teeth with 30,000 pulsations per minute, and I say that's faster than Superman. So you get a real good clean with an electric toothbrush than you would when you, if you manually tried to brush your teeth. And at least you know you brushed your teeth for two minutes. Exactly. So that's Time that's to an think. added, <laughs> an added good thing. So are there holistic dental implants? Uh, holistic dental implants? Yes. There are different materials that you can use for implants. Um, you can use titanium. There's also zirconium. Um, so it depends. If somebody has a metal allergy, they're probably going to be a candidate for the zirconium implant. Um, so depending on uh, where people are and what kind of allergies that they have, there's definitely ways to make sure that they have holistic implants for sure. So there's hope if it's too late. That's good to know. But thank you, Dr. Patel, for being with us. What a great world of information you've given us. If you guys want to and find out more about this, www.sfgreendentist.com. It has been a pleasure. Thank you all for tuning in. This is The Cure, and I'm your host, Amy Cabo. I leave you today with the word, today's word, by someone who wishes to remain anonymous. Trust in God. We all have our days where we feel we can't survive. Sometimes dreams are shattered. Friendships may fall apart. Loved ones may hurt us. Finances may worry us. Sickness may overtake us. We may even lose people we love.